Warning, All Things Crime is a true crime production that may contain violent or disturbing material. Viewer or listener discretion is advised. I never really understood how valuable uh, a public information officer was because, I mean, you, you just see, oh, someone that, you know, pops on TV and does this interview. And even when I was in drug chemistry and the help that I needed, I mean, I was just providing, you know, these quick updates. I really wasn't in the hot seat because don't do drugs is not a very difficult message to sell. But the amount of, I guess, demand there is for what's happening, oh, we want transparency, we want information, you know, yesterday, you know, they want the information before it even happens. And to make sure that you're not silent because, you know, otherwise chaos ensues. It's just, it's just so vital. Okay, welcome, welcome to another episode of All Things Crime. And today I have a very special guest, uh, Nellie Miles out of GBI, Georgia Bureau of Investigation. She's a just fantastic person. I've, I've gotten to know her a little bit on Clubhouse, if some of you are on that platform and uh, heard her input and very, very knowledgeable about everything that happens with GBI. And uh, that's why she's the Public Affairs Director. Is that the official title, Nellie? That's it, Jared. Awesome. Well, welcome to this episode and appreciate you coming on. And I, I was hoping that you could just introduce yourself a little bit, talk about your career, how you went from becoming a forensic chemist to what you're doing now. Oh, absolutely. And first of all, thank you so much for um, having me. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Again, Nellie Miles, current, currently the public affairs director for the GBI. I have been with the GBI now for 21 years. It's, it's um, just amazing to think that I've, I've been there for that, that time. It's a wonderful agency. I got my start in forensics. Um, my, if you can believe it, my degree is actually in chemistry. And I was pre-med. I went to Emory in Atlanta and I was so focused in on being pre-med. I'm first generation. And so my parents are um, immigrated from Nigeria. And if you know anything about West African parents for their kids, they only pretty much give you three options. You can either be a doctor, lawyer, teacher. <laughs> so I just picked doctor, not because I necessarily had, you know, that probably burning desire. But when I went to college, I went ahead and studied chemistry with the idea that I was going to pursue um, the pre-med career path. And then after I graduated, you know, I just wanted to take a break. You know, at that time, early 20s, I thought I had really worked so hard and I just, you know, needed that break. Now I know um, a lot more <laughs> further down the road. Um, but I stumbled this into someone who worked for the GBI in forensics. And I had no idea what forensics, you know, was at that time. Um, there was no CSI. I mean, I don't remember forensic files. Closest thing I really remember were that I just for me that I just really enjoyed. I used to love the show Hunter, and I think there was you know it was like a police show, and I just I I love the storylines on that show, and I think there was a little bit there, but I just didn't know about it. And but it was an amazing way to apply a chemistry degree because I felt like after I had studied all that time, I said, listen, I'm going to use this degree even if it's for two minutes. I'm going to use it and. <laughs> the GBI was a perfect opportunity. And so I started the GBI as a forensic chemist. I tested drugs for six years on the bench. Um, eventually I started managing the, the unit and stayed in that unit for 16 years, uh, believe it or not. And towards the end, that latter end, drug trends became a, a huge hot topic. And when it came to what's called synthetic cannabinoids, basically K2 spice, synthetic marijuana, it was really popular. and the previous spokespersons for the GBI would come over with the news media and they'd say, hey, can you talk about this? But we want you to really break it down. Don't get too sciencey on us. And, um, you know, I just found that very interesting to be able to kind of communicate and educate the public on what we were seeing, what we were doing. And also part of public affairs is uh, the legislative aspect. And so I'm a legislative liaison for the agency under the Gold Dome, helping pass laws that apply to the GBI. And so I would go to our uh, Gold Dome and testify when I was still in 
in chemistry. And I told, you know, I, I kind of planted a few seeds, which is, you know, what you have to do when you're, you know, you're trying to, I think, you know, set your sights on other things. I just said, listen, if you ever have a spot in public affairs, um, even if it's just an understudy, I'm not looking for a full-time job. I just thought it was interesting. So, you know, look me up. <laughs> you know, I'm your girl if you ever have that. And in uh, 2014, it, it, my, my dreams came true. They were actualized where I transitioned from the sciences to communications. I stepped in as the deputy director, which is the number two role in public affairs. Um, then, uh, then GBI director Vernon Keenan appointed me to it and a year later was promoted to public affairs director. And so here I am, a very nonlinear career path, but this is me. That is fantastic. I'll tell you, it's a couple of things that really jumped into my mind as you were talking. Number one is, it's amazing how many immigrant parents, they recognize all the opportunities that America offers and offers, if I can speak right, talking to a PIO, right? <laughs> um, but by recognizing all of those opportunities, they really push their kids and and I, th I think that's fantastic. I think more people really need to step out because th their potential is so much more. And it's just amazing to see how you have obviously really taken advantage of that and you're living your potential. And it, I, I applaud you for that. So second thing is, you know, going from a chemist and being, because most of the chemists that I know are more lab folks. They, they don't really like the spotlight. They don't really like talking, especially in, when someone sticks a camera in their face. A lot of them are just like, ah, you know, that's the last thing they want to see. So how is it you overcame that? It, or has that always kind of been your nature? You've always kind of been drawn more to the public side of it. You know, that's so funny because whenever I would uh, meet people from other agencies, remember the DEA, FBI, this is when I was still in the lab. I mean, they always looked at me like I had three heads because they were just like, we just don't know chemists that you know are like you you're just you're just different and so and I will say just I mean I mean I I love my crime lab people but even when you go over there and try to get them to you know do stuff for our social media and stuff they're just like ah oh, no I'd rather not and um you know we're still we're still working on that my husband's actually our crime lab director ironically but that's a whole different podcast about <laughs> working right. with someone you know um but uh I think that just you know what I up, I know your husband you know my husband, Cleveland Miles? Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I know Cleveland. Yeah. Yeah, he's yeah. a great Of course he's you a... do, DNA. Of course you yeah. do. <laughs> oh, Cleveland's a great guy. Oh my yeah, gosh. That's what, that's what oh, this is funny. too funny. Small We're making world. this connection during <laughs> the hilarious. podcast. Oh my word. Okay. Yeah. That's so because I was out there, you know, you guys own an MVAC. Mm -hmm. And well, in fact, you own three of them, but they're in Atlanta. Yeah, when I when I first went out, uh, what was it? Geez, 2015 or something, maybe 16. Mm -hmm. That I was out there training all of the uh, the the DNA serology folks on mm -hmm. collecting DNA with the MVAC. Yeah. yeah, I totally know Cleveland. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that is so funny. awesome. That is hilarious. Wow. I, so I've seen you Clubhouse podcast world this, but I forget that you know I forget what you do. You know every right. day in this DNA yeah. world. Yeah, so, no, yeah. my my day job is actually. <laughs> uh, helping, you know, agencies acquire and then get trained on the MVAC system. So yeah, yeah, yeah. my first love is DNA, but that's cool. Yeah. It's that's so really funny with, that's... with COVID, you know, we just kind of had to figure out different ways of, of reaching out and it's just kind of morphed into this figure out, you know, all of these different aspects of the investigative process. Yeah. Because I found in my travels that there's so many people that make the process work. Mm -hmm. And from the, the officer in uniform who secures the crime scene and actually, you know, first responds to a 911 call. And then from there, this massive machine gets kicked into motion, especially when it's a heinous crime, like, you know, rape mm -hmm. and, and murder. It's it, all the players that have to be a part of actually solving that crime. The understanding in general for most people in society, really, they, they have no idea. They have no idea how many people it takes to actually solve a major case like that. Yep. And then, you know, your part of it is to help inform the public 
help kind of keep everybody informed on where the, you know, the progress of the agency, where the evidence is going, you know, all those kind of things. So, and you know, like I'm telling you that, but so in that context, why don't you kind of fill us in on really what your role is? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I never really understood how valuable uh, a public information officer was because, I mean, you, you just see, oh, it's someone that, you know, pops on TV and does this interview. And even when I was in drug chemistry and the help that I needed, I mean, I was just providing, you know, these quick updates and really wasn't in the hot seat because don't do drugs is not a very difficult message to sell. But the amount of, I guess, demand there is for what's happening, oh, we want transparency, we want information, you know, yesterday, you know, they want the information before it even happens. And to make sure that we're not silent because, you know, otherwise chaos ensues, it's just, it's just so vital. So, I mean, every single day, even today, we had um, an officer involved shooting down in Camden County, which is really close to the Florida line. And, um, you know, right away we were getting, you know, we get inquiries from the public media, well, media inquiries rather, just the basic mainstream media. But then sometimes when things happen and social media folks get a, a hold of it, it takes on a whole life of its own. And so to be quite honest with you, you're not gonna meet many PIOs that are gonna say, well, you know, they're not working, you know, they're not like on 24 seven, but like that's, that's the first thing. I mean, the GBI covering the state I and mean, there are 10 million people in the state and even though we don't have thousands of GBI agents, we do have 15 regional investigative offices that you know, are strategically placed throughout the state. So if they get called out um, to something, I mean, I'm immediately having to figure out, okay, what sort of preliminary information can we get out? Because you, have, you could potentially have a public safety issue where there might be somebody on the loose. We wanna you know, warn the public. We might wanna be able to try to you know, try to get some, maybe some leads, some investigative information to help them advance the case. And I mean, for me, those are, those are so, those are so um, critical, but then there's also just in this role of sort of being like a strategic advisor to your chief executive office. Or I always, we always tell people like this role is not one of those nice to have, oh, if they volunteer, I mean, hey, there's a reporter outside handling. No, this person literally should be at the top of your organization. So I, I, you know, I'm, point, I'm appointed by the GBI director and it's really kind of to show like the level of importance of making sure you've got someone who is, you know, just kind of ready to keep our command staff abreast of what's happening. Um, just making sure that the public is again, constantly being, being informed because, you know, after incidents, we go back to 2014, we always go back to Ferguson. And of course, you know, you know, just this past year, we had the incident in, in in, in Minnesota and, you know, oftentimes, you know, it obviously when there's, we always say when there's like a use of force situation, like it's never gonna look pretty. I mean, the video goes out there and it goes viral. It's never gonna look good, but it's really, you know, really important that we as law enforcement agencies kind of get out there and get ahead of the narrative because that's, that's for me the big thing. And even though, you know, media can be, you know, they can put some pressure on you. I'm usually less concerned about the media um, than I am what happens on social media, because at least I know with the reporters, certainly they, they've got, you know, they've got a job to do, but, you know, they're, they'll, they'll work off of what we give them. They'll go around and try to get other people, but social media, <laughs> I mean, when I tell you just create stories and the lies, I'm just like, how do they come up with this? Like, they are just, this is way beyond hashtag fake news. These are just, this is just like, complete misinformation, complete lies. And so you just gotta, we have to stay ahead of that. It's so important. Oh, that's amazing. The amount of misinformation that is out on social media is incredible. It's crazy. And like you said, the, you know, the, all these different hashtags and things that go viral almost instantly. It seems that a lot of it is anti-law law enforcement. And so, you know, it's not that you really can take one side or the other, especially being affiliated with the, with the lab. But in my mind, most reporters at least are responsible enough that they will get the facts and, and then, you know, create the story. But social media, man, it's just wham, there's a, there's a narrative out there. And so how do you, how do you conscious, I mean, I, I know you said you got to get ahead of it, but mm -hmm. what do you specifically do to, to get ahead of it? Well, I will tell you, so the biggest thing is that, 
And I think that some law enforcement agencies don't, you know, maybe not aware of this. They might have, say, a PIO and maybe the folks on the P their PIO staff or public information staff that are like they're responsible for in engaging the public. But if their investigators that are handling the case don't understand, like they don't understand the plan, they don't know what their crisis communications plan looks like or what it, you know, what it should represent then it's difficult because they may not want to, you know, give up information. They want to hold it close, but everyone has to, first of all, internally understand like, okay, when something happens, we're going to need this information. And that's really, really key. And so as soon as I see for us the command page, I get the command page and basically it says, okay, we're responding to an, an officer involved shooting. And I, mean, I hate to say it, but that's for us because we're the, we're a state agency that that's what we do. We, in, we investigate, basically the majority of the officer involved shootings that result in death or serious bodily injury. Now, a lot of people think that's all the GBI does that when we're out in outside of Metro Atlanta and work in homicides and ag assaults and sexual assaults, they're like, wait, wait, what are y'all doing? I'm like, no, the, you know, we're still law enforcement, you know, sworn law enforcement. We work all types of crimes, but the ones you really hear about, of course, is the officer involved shootings. I mean, we do our best to publicize the other work but you know, right away to try and stay ahead of it, what I do is literally I am monitoring social media. I'm looking. I'm uh, I'm looking to see what because typically people are going to tag the GBI. GBI, what are you doing about this? What's going on? Even if we're not involved, and or if there's a video that gets out there, you just jump on there and you, and you monitor it. And the best thing though is to just go ahead and know with your investigative team, like for us, if it's a for instance, this case down in the South Georgia area, you know, there's like a team of people that I'm working with, this is a special agent in charge, assistant special agent in charge, maybe the inspector, and I create this chat group and we start, you know, hey, what can we say right now? You know, and it's because one of those things is like you have to try and be a buffer for them because as, um, you know, I don't want the media hammering them where they're, um, you know, they're trying to work the case. So that's what I'm doing, even if I'm not on the scene because covering the state, you know, without like a helicopter, it's a little hard to get to a scene all, all the time right away. But right away, they can kind of tell me some basic information that, you know, this started off with a, um, they were serving, executing a search warrant or, you know, you know, one person was injured and just some real basic information that can be verified that you know it's not going to change because you want to be quick, but you want to be right as well. You know, you want accurate information going out. And so I'll go ahead and put that out. Like, for instance, I'll put it on Twitter. This is what's going on. We will update you as soon as possible and still try to engage. And if there's like really no response on social media or people are just kind of patiently waiting for a news release or maybe a press conference, then I can kind of, I can kind of calm down a little bit. I'm not hammering my folks as much, but the moment I start to see some chatter on social media, I don't care if it's one comment where it's like a one citizen, because that's all it takes is one, right? right. <laughs> it started. Then I'm immediately like, they're talking on social media. I'm gonna need a little bit more that's verified. Let's keep feeding, you know, a little update here and there until you all get to a place where you have enough kind of preliminary information that we can provide like a sound update. And so that's just really important to try and stay, um, stay ahead of it. And thankfully in my state, I've already established good relationships with our media before crises happens. And so, I'm um, right now doing like virtual chats with them, like different, Georgia has 11 uh, media markets. And so I'll say Atlanta, you know, hey, what's going on? Let's check in Columbus. Pr prior to COVID, I'd have the media come to the GBI. Here, meet the director, meet our command staff. Here's our bomb unit. Here's our crime scene, um, crime scene unit. And that way we can have these relationships that way. When there's maybe like a little bit of a delay because folks are working, they're not you know, they're not, they're, be, they're as, as patient as the media can be. So I don't too much worry about the media sort of betraying me and, and you know, putting stuff out and, 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 and spinning a story out of control as, as much as I do social media. Yeah, that's, uh, boy, I, I hope more PIOs, you know, uh, directors of communication out there are listening to this. 